But as with AI, I think we should leverage that. We should make sure that these tools give you that enough information on what is my entire test coverage. Give me 100% test coverage for my code, for my regression test cycle, for my enhancements. And that way, there are no bugs that can go through into production. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 218. Continuous testing with BlazeMeter. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, as time moves along in 2023, if I hear the phrase AI one more time, I think I'm going to scream. Well, you should prepare yourself for screaming because you will be hearing it many times every day for the rest of your life. That's how it works, man. I cannot work anymore without AI. So if nobody else, I will be screaming it, screaming it at you. At some point, I will learn it. I will concede. But until that point, I'm just going to be yelling at the clouds. And on today's show, we have Baroth on from Perforce, and actually, BlazeMeter, or Broth, do you want to f- correct me completely on that? Hey, everyone. Thanks, Darren and Victor, for having me here. Uh, you're spot on. Right now, Perforce, prior to that, it was BlazeMeter, so we were uh, acquired by Perforce uh, actually a year before. Okay, I was trying to get that right, because anytime there's acquisitions, it's like, oh, okay, how uh, chicken, egg, but we're close. And of course, unfortunately, I butchered your name, so you can always correct me on your name. I'm sorry. I that's anybody fine. that's been listening know that I have a really hard time getting names right. But we were talking about AI. And yes, I, I know I'm going to give in at some point. But what about AI and BlazeMeter has been well known for years, right? I've I remember it many years in the past. And I think what we want to talk about is AI and testing. Now, BlazeMeter, you can talk about continuous testing, but let's if we worked our way towards continuous, that might be interesting, but let's start with the simple of the test itself. Used to, we would write all of our tests, point, click, generate, write code, whatever it is, right? We get the test written, but then somebody would move something, especially with UI testing. They move something one pixel and everything breaks. And that somebody is not testing. And that somebody's not testing, correct. Fire him or her. Exactly. <laughs> but, but now... In theory, magic hand wave, AI can maybe help us solve some of those silly breakages that we might be causing on ourselves. Is that even an option? Well, let me, you know what, actually, I I read this somewhere, the analogy that I usually start with when I'm, you know, when I'm talking to my customers or talking to industry folks is, I wish Ford was here today to see his, see this software evolution, right? Because this was in 19th century when he came about this assembly line where how do you move, how do you build tons and tons of vehicles on an assembly line? I think the same concept right now we're taking over in the software business. I think in the early 2000s, that's when, you know, whether you call it AI, machine learning, I think the software right now has, has evolved so much. You can set up continuous delivery, you can set up continuous testing, while the code is being built or delivered for a faster time to market. I'm not sure I like the analogy. Uh, and everybody's using the same analogy, right? Because I don't think it's analogous one to each other. Meaning that if I would compare factory, like car factory, with software, that would be, you know, in the past when we were distributing software on CDs or disks, hey, how can I now replicate what I designed into many, 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 many copies, right? Which is 
equivalent to making many, 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 many cars. But big part, and I'm not saying all, there is continuous integration delivery and stuff like that, but big part of what we do is closer to, hey, let's design a new car or improvement of an existing model, right? It's less of a factory and I feel more of a design part of the process, right? Before we start actually creating replicas of that something. I, I totally agree with you on that. But I think with the with the AI and, and then the testing, when you when you combine those two together, you're, you're, you're looking at a lot of benefits. I mean, you're looking at early detection of defects, right? Once Once you have the code built, if you have certain AI tools that are embedded in your software lifecycle, it can find defects early in the lifecycle. Then, you, you know, the cost of remediation when these defects go into production is huge for big companies. Let's take an example, right? I mean, I don't know if you guys heard about this, the whole Taylor Swift and the Ticketmaster debacle. I mean, what happened there? The Ticketmaster opened up the pre-sale event, but then it just crashed on the day because they were not ready for, for, the, for the amount of volume that they saw or they didn't they weren't they weren't aware of the chatbots that were trying to purchase these tickets so in a way the scalability of the environment you know the code that was released with enough infrastructure scalability approach was was not there maybe maybe if they if they have taken care of certain tools taken care of certain frameworks certain strategies with maybe ai or maybe continuous testing or continuous delivery th things wouldn't have fallen apart yeah, the, in that specific case, they obviously had not predicted that they might have a surge of in requests, right, in in traffic. And that's exactly is what the fundamental aspect of continuous testing with AI is all about: is how do I reduce risk? How do I embed my continuous testing? and mitigate all the risk by identifying these defects, by identifying these vulnerabilities early in, in, in my development. And, and obviously that will help whatever organization is, is, is including those to prevent security breaches, downtimes, which, which is exactly what happened to Ticketmaster, which probably happened to a ton of other companies out there and you know, obviously impact negatively into their business operations. This is, I feel one of the areas and this is not really my expertise, so I'm, I might be saying, saying something that doesn't work or is not correct, but this is something that AI can potentially be very useful because one of the things required for AI is data, right? You need data in order to train the model one way or another. And in that's the example that you were saying, right? We are talking about performance testing that was not done on sufficient volume or more likely was not done by simulating real user behavior, right? And we have user behavior, that's your production. We know what users are doing. Now we're missing that piece of, okay, now that you know what users are doing, you have the data, hopefully, let, let's assume for a second that they do have a data from real users. How can we create some kind of load testing, some kind of performance testing, but not by Joe defining, okay, now I click this button and I click that button, you know, that's that's us trying to guess what users do. And we have real users, right? Or at least they had the real users. And you actually, Victor, you got a, you know, you brought a great point. I mean, for any testing, whether it's continuous, whether it's waterfall, agile or AI based, realistic test data is probably the the most important aspect of, of your testing paradigm. Right? If you have to mimic all the negative scenarios, all the edge boundary edge conditions, if you wanna if you have to simulate production like you know behavior, you would need access to that realistic data. And there are ways in which with with continuous testing or with AI you can simulate those. You can extrapolate data from historical information. You can do a lot of advanced planning and optimization with that data. There are a ton of testing frameworks or automation frameworks that are available out there in the industry that can help companies do that. How can we use a subset of data and simulate all these different conditions, negative, edge, boundary, smoke, 
whatever term that you put in you need realistic test data to make sure that your regression is handled your incoming enhancements are handled or your future integrations are handled i believe that's true i just feel bad for the swifties that just weren't able to get their tickets but that's a whole another problem let's talk about testing now pre ai let's call it and let's call it testing with ai we're used to the old way of doing things we had that for decades how does introducing ai into testing other than we think about github copilot can help us write tests there are startups galore i believe there's more ai startups happening than there are javascript frameworks being born on a daily basis whomever is raising and and this is real i know that from quite a few example if you're raising money right now we see money your chances of success increase drastically if you put the word ai until recently it was security now it's ai well i would say until recently it was all about mining and i would say the the bitcoin <laughs> but i think in a testing context yes i would say from security to devops to now i think it's all ai 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 testing ai development so but i think let's let's look at the current you know darren just pointed out how do we look at the current testing landscape uh, so to speak pre ai and with ai right i think testing fundamentally has been a, a linear in in a linear fashion right it, it has been conducted in a waterfall mechanism you have your ideation that kicks in with your business analysts or the business users and then those get get into the developers and those guys start building their their core their services and then comes the testing phase right this is this has been a linear and then comes the the you know the pre production and then the production and the operations but i think that shift has has happened from from waterfall into agile into a more of continuous testing now where you're embedding testing within your software life cycle meaning as you create your ideas as you create your requirements there are mechanisms where with ai or even maybe early stages of uh, of of frameworks where you can generate test cases from those requirements you can generate test data uh, for example right if if you have a service that you need to build uh, there is a request and there is a response that was written on a on a document you can actually generate a, a mock or a sample i would say a service you know you can generate data from that you can generate test cases from that so i think it's been happening the shift of testing landscape has been changing over time whether you call it devops whether you call it automation whether you call it continuous testing or continuous delivery it's it's been changing i think industry has been seeing a lot of shift left testing aspects to it a lot of automation where you know they're bringing tools like selenium apping apm uh blaze mirror uh, test ng tricent is a lot into their into their automation framework where they can automate everything and anything that that's possible which doesn't require a lot of manual and in general continuous delivery right every time if you if you let's, this is going back to that analogy of how do i put everything in an assembly line for a software the code is getting built let the continuous delivery pick it up let the test cases get run automatically and then it just gets pushed into into pre production or production so continuous delivery has been a biggest aspect of i would say at least this devops era where companies like netflix or facebook or all of all of these new age companies are are releasing code at a quicker succession in the past i think we have seen you and i you know all of us have seen that it used to be quarterly releases or half yearly releases or or maybe monthly releases but i think now it's weekly to daily right now so so the time the enhancements get to the user has exponentially grown and i think ai even though you wouldn't notice but i think some of the ai that that modeling that machine learning that all of that has has slowly is trapped into that and 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 that's how that's what i've been seeing uh, at various customers you know, the way i see it we we indeed switched from yearly releases or quarterly releases to weekly or daily and that's mostly from my perspective because of testing testing was really problematic it doesn't matter how fast you write the new three lines of code you need to do regression testing that takes takes months months right when you're doing manually now we don't do that anymore right but now i feel that we have a different problem is and that problem is okay this does not work how didn't we caught up caught that 
hey, uh, nobody thought about that scenario, right? Nobody thought about this scenario. Nobody thought about that scenario. And I feel that that's the area really where, again, going back to my previous comment, what do you mean you didn't think about that scenario? That's happening in production for months now, right? Let's put it this way. How do we capture user behavior and convert that user behavior into tests in this case, right? There are a ton of ways how you can accomplish that, right? I mean, obviously, when we're trying to build services into uh, into any product, y- user behavior or user requirements are probably the primary ideation that you need to realize. And when you look at user behavior, the same thing, right? Does a user require... In fact, there was a, an article that came out where when a user jumps on a specific website, whether it's on a mobile device or, or, or a browser, at 59% of the time, if they see latency on the page, if there is not enough, it's, if it's not a user, uh, the user experience is not good, they, they would tend to move away and, and take their business somewhere else. You know, it's, it's relatively important for, for a developer, for a tester, or, or anybody who's trying to come up with these solutions to make sure that user behavior is mimicked, user behavior is, is handled, you know, while you're trying to construct or, or make your products uh, productized. Let's go back to the linear thought that you were talking about. Old school ways, everything was linear. We write the code, then somebody would write the tests and whatever, right? That That's a normal path. But I want to mix in what Victor was saying is like, okay, we, we're trapping all of this data from production. This has been happening in production. So if we're even halfway decent within our jobs, we're writing integration tests or something to run in our test suite the next time through. So it ties along with whatever the bug fix is that we're doing. But a lot of times those new regression or those new tests that we're writing to cover the bug that we discovered still doesn't cover all the edge cases. Is that one of the places where AI can really help us is, okay, here's this test suite I have what am I missing? You know, what are, what are the other tests that I should have written that I didn't think about? Great point, right? See, what AI can, or, or any intelligent framework could help in, in that context is, you guys heard about code coverage, right? You guys heard about a lot. When, when somebody is, is trying to build their code, they usually do a lot of code coverage. But how about test coverage? When there is a new announcement that comes through and you see a bug, there could be a ton of reasons why that, that bug came through. It, it could be a bad regression test cycle, or it could be a, a, you know, a flaky test that came through from previous production. It could be test data that was not available realistically to basically test all the edge conditions and the boundary conditions. But with AI, what you can do is you, know, you can embed something called as test coverage or combined with core coverage into your, into your test creation process or test plans. Has a testing unit when they, you know, when you guys, get, uh, when they get the, I would say, uh, business requirements. As you change those business requirements into testing and you know testing requirements, you can actually model, you know, using whatever AI the uh, uh, mechanism that's available out there to make sure that you cover all the permutations and combinations of your testing scenario. Basically, if you're on a, if you're trying to log into a specific page, what are the different caveats or what are the different combinations in a specific user behavior from login to log out can happen every possible scenario there are tools that can give you that availability with manual testing it's not easy with linear testing it's pretty complex to come up with that model whereas with ai i think we should leverage that we should make sure that these tools give you that enough information on what is my entire test coverage give me 100 percent test coverage for my code, for my regression test cycle, for my enhancements. And that way, there are no bugs that can go through into production. I think that that would at least make me happy, if not many others, right? Because to be honest, now when I was listening to you, I was already freaking out kind of, man, if I'm going to write that silly code one more time, you know, hey, a username, uh, click login button without password. Cl- put password be without the uh, username. Click login button. Click login button. With login button without anything and all that permutations. That's such a mundane work. It, it reminds me on 
you know, writing getter setters in Java to infinity. Kind of, why do I do this? Kind of, is there anything better that I can do with my life than think of all the permutations of 27 fields in a web page? Yes, and 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 again, I mean, Darren pointed out earlier in the call that when when a small object changes on a browser, somebody changed a small. It's a little bit of shift of where that object was from, you know, on on a specific browser. It changes the entire testing suite, right? They either you either have to rewrite those test cases to make sure that it object is placed or object has changed in your regression suite. Right, that those are the instances where the bugs will go into into production, and then it's it's a huge cost to remediate that again with AI, with with our current test coverage combined with core coverage. You can make sure that you know those are those are handled. And again, just the challenges. I mean, we're talking about the challenges, right? Obviously, we're talking about the benefits as well. But let's just talk about the challenges for adopting this whole continuous testing with AI. AI automation is is complex. You know, it requires significant skill set. It requires uh, time. It, it, you know, the organizations, all the organizations, need to have skill resources and invest. You know, in such automation tools. So again, integrating into development processes with AI is not easy. The team needs to define clear processes how they want to define AI testing into their QA processes. Same thing, Victor. Data is important. Uh, managing environments is important. So obviously, all of these are challenges. But I think with AI, we'll, we'll definitely get there. Among other things, and correct me if I'm wrong, testing is in big part all about learning the behavior, learning how the application behaves, and then incorporating those learnings into the test suite one way or another, and increasing the coverage over time. Right? No. How often today? Testers, and I'm using this as a very broad term, anybody involved in testing one way or another, right? How much they're involved these days in production itself, right? Because if there is a place we can learn how something behaves, it's, it's probably production, right? That, that, that's where real, real things are happening, much more real than, than in any test suite, right? How much do we have that feedback loop from, okay, so I'm actually... Today, I'm not writing tests. Today, I'm sitting and watching production, learning how it behaves, and then going back to writing tests. Can you repeat that question again? Yeah. How much do we see? Do we see in industry as a whole, people involved in testing actually being uh, involved in monitoring and observability of production, if for no other reason, for the sake of learning how that application behaves and incorporating it back into testing? Oh yeah, that's 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 a great point. See, uh, what you're talking about is is we were talking about shift left before, but I think this is more of a shift right. In order to observe how the performance, uh, or, or in general how productionized environments are, or the services are, or, or it's all about metrics. It's it's all about application performance in production. It's a 360 degree view. I mean, as a developer, right? If I as a tester, if they can get access to some of those metrics. And use that as an SLA. Use that as a, uh, I would say, as a failover criteria in the testing environments. It's obviously, you know, a, a, I would say a tick mark for them. Yeah, meaning, I've seen customers where you know they have leverage shift right mechanisms where you get the application performance from production and then use them in your testing environments. For example, if you're doing performance testing, right? How would you know what is your right throughput? What is your right SLA? If you don't have the metrics to compare with. You may be testing for a million users, but in production, it may be more than a million users, or it may be five million users, and there, there'll be a dedicated metrics that you can take it from, you know, observe how, how your browser performs, how your application performs, how in general, and then take those and then, you know, use it in your testing. Could we make a big leap here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to make a big leap. With AI... We should be able to get to either complete or near complete test coverage. Do you believe that's true or false? I think that's true. We can achieve near true co coverage for testers. 
Okay, so to me, that almost feels like explicit fuzzing. We're not replacing fuzzing, but now fuzzing would really only catch those things that weren't covered by something that was fully generated. Is that another big leap? I think we're getting there. Uh, I think that's definitely what the industry is going towards. That's exactly what you know. Almost all the products or the tools or, or services or, or you know anyone who's who's trying to build AI-based solutions out there is, is trying to make sure that we give, if not hundred percent, but at least that level of confidence that these tools will provide that coverage, and then obviously help them find their defects earlier on uh, in their life cycle and then reduce the whole overall negative impact to their business operations. So assuming that's true, we take our test coverage from, let's say it was 100 tests before. That would be really low, by the way, to anybody listening. But let's say we, we were running good with 100 tests and that suite would take 10 minutes and we were fine with it taking 10 minutes. Now, thanks to the power of AI, that 100 has turned into 100,000. That seems very rational to me, looking at most enterprise systems. But now that 100 that took 10 or 15 minutes before now takes days. I think that that might be looking at it wrong in a way. Is Yeah, you have that would be the same thing as saying, hey, we have 1 million users over a year, right? Uh, we're going to reproduce that in a day or something like that, right? The fact that you have 100,000 tests does not necessarily mean that you need to be running all the tests always. If you somehow that's, That was my next point. Okay. Right, that was my uh, next point. That's where I was heading is, okay, now I have 100,000 tests. If I was to run the full suite, it could take a couple of days, which again would be okay because I know I can trust the coverage. But I can't wait two days now to do a deploy because I'm trying to do a daily deployment. So how can we hit the sweet spot of, yes, I want all 100,000, but I still want to be able to, quote unquote, run it in 10 minutes? How do I decide what the real tests are that need to be run? Well, in that context, uh, let, let's look at this. So as, as an example, what you said is if you have 100 tests and then now it's expanded to 100,000, now you need to think about is that a realistic number? Does your test coverage really give that big of a number? Well, let's assume for a moment that the AI is able to actually generate that for me, right? It's going out. This goes back to my, this is now explicit fuzzing, right? It's it's working every possible boundary condition of every input for everything that a human just couldn't write that it, within, you know, a day or two, right? It's, it's effectively big generated code at this point. Okay. Let's bring it, let's bring it back into reason. Let's say it went from hundred to 10,000. Is that a better argument? I would or is say that so. still I too mean, big? Okay, I mean, it's it's not as big of a scale, but that would be more realistic to me. I'm, I'm just stating that if all of a sudden we have this Cambrian explosion of tests that show up overnight because AI got busy, but now that's impacting me on actually doing delivery. How do I know which tests, whether it was the human written ones or the AI written ones, provide the most value to ensure that next delivery is going to be the best possible delivery I can make. And that's exactly where the matrix come in, right? For you to compare is one, I got my test coverage. Now I have, you know, a little bit, I would say I have more than hundred. You said 10,000, right? You probably have 10,000 test cases that need to be executed. But then what we're saying is with AI, you don't have to run them in a linear way. You start executing them as individual services are getting built and integrated. So there in itself, you would run certain combinations, certain permutations, and you would validate that within your continuous delivery pipeline that this was executed already, right? If, if there is a service that was built, and for that specific service, if it's 100 tests or 100 combinations for that for single, single test, it's already been executed as part of the continuous delivery, and you have those metrics to, to handle them. You would only see an exponential growth in time of execution is when you go and run or execute these in a linear fashion the way it was done 10 years ago. With continuous testing, that is shifting, that is changing. And that's exactly what we're trying to discuss here is execute them 
with unit testing execute them earlier so that those conditions are already met and you have the numbers you have the metrics to follow on and once you get to an sit or, or an integrated environment or pre production environment all you're trying to execute is can i scale my infrastructure right you're doing a load and performance can i basically you're you're increasing your throughput in order to handle that obviously you have you need to increase your servers behind the scene so that's where it is right embed your ai based or continuous testing based approach earlier to reduce to get away from from that longer duration of test cycles i think that's that's in my opinion that's how i think we should approach this or the customers have been approaching it i'm going to throw something random in the air and see whether it sticks how about we don't run tests and if you do something like canary deployments let's say right where i say hey 1% of my users are going to see this thingy right and i'm going to run tests slightly differently by monitoring the behavior of those users those that are hitting 1% right which is effectively converting real people into testers right and monitoring the behavior of the system and then just increase the reach of that release and decrease which effectively would convert some kind of would convert real people into testers and observability and combined with some form of exploration of the results of the outcomes into testing in a way in production directly would that be feasible is or that's too much of a science fiction in a way no i think it's feasible i i think some some you know some customers they like to test their their in, in production directly to understand the the behavior for example there there's a lot of these uh, financial companies or trading companies you know they cannot test during during the market hours they usually tend to test in production during the weekends why and exact reason is victor as you just pointed out is to understand the behavior of that user and maybe this observability tools can take those changes and convert into test cases because that's all that's what machine learning is all about that's what ai is all about that's what these intelligent tools are all about is is you keep on feeding those scenarios those behaviors into those frameworks then it'll, it'll just ship out right this was a a test that was executed in production which you know there was with a defect let's use that for our regression suite let's use that towards our integration testing so that's another way of how these models work is making sure you you grab it's like a 360 degree as i mentioned earlier on you said model there which we've been using the big word ai or at least the the more press release friendly ai aren't we really going to need to start training our own models and not just use genericized models it seems like all the metric data that i'm catching that is for me i would need to start training that against now these new large language models so that way i have whenever i ask that question i get back an answer that is specific to my environment doesn't that seem reasonable I think you're spot on on that. Typically that's that's how the models get trained, right? Once you have a template, once you have these models or language large language models built, you know, those are capable enough to it's a continuous iterative process. It just takes the incoming information from production or or even within to keep the environment, pre-production environments and then create test cases out of that. So yeah, that's that's a possibility for sure. One last question that we're going to get into we mentioned it but we ran quickly away flaky tests how in the heck is ai going to help us with flaky tests so with with flaky the term itself is kind of derogative but when you say flaky test these tests usually are something which come through regression or from previous releases exactly what we talked about you know the object being changed on, on a certain aspect of an application or a browser and those tests will fail right these are all flaky tests so with ai what we can get to is 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 reduce that risk of certain changes in in the code uh, it'll be able to cover those those scenarios uh, and then help in the regression 
test cycle that these flaky tests won't come through uh, and then you'll be able to just just find defects uh. well the joys of flaky is always the network was working then it wasn't working and then it's like okay maybe we push that test too far to the right maybe we need to not let that one be right maybe this is where ai could help us in predicting okay i see that typically you're down between 7 p.m. Let's use the trading platform. We see that the it's currently in trading hours, so these tests should not be run, whether they were flaky or not. Right? Just I I think we don't know what we don't know yet, and that's exciting and also terrifying all at the same time. Yeah, not only with AI, but even the continuous testing process might help flaky tests to isolate them or or maybe. Uh, a process where we can reduce them is maybe start small, maybe identify those unstable tests, separate them out, or add more tests that have a, a lot of tests driven that can handle all the permutations. I think those are the different variations of how you can uh, you know isolate flaky tests from from becoming a burden. So Blaze Meter, been around for a number of years, but just in case people have been living under a rock. Why don't you talk to us about BlazeMeter? Initially, the journey kind of started off as a performance testing tool. It's a SaaS-based solution, uh, and then eventually it evolved as a continuous testing platform, right? where you can do your performance testing on a simple browser. Again, as I said, it's a SaaS, it's a SaaS platform. You can do functional testing. Uh, you can do uh, service virtualization. Obviously, service virtualization is something where if there is a constraint uh, of a backend system or, or, or a service that is down or it's not available or it's a paid service you know for your development and testing you can mock you can virtualize those so you can do that too within the platform and then there is you know that api 360 degree monitoring aspect of it where you get metrics from production and then you can use that those slas and then, and those metrics within the testing platform uh, on top of that it's completely built on open source BlazeMirror supports Selenium, Gatling, JMirror, Taurus, you know, any any open source technologies that are out there, we pretty much take them and then execute them within within BlazeMirror. So think of BlazeMirror as if uh, it's it's like a a nice robust reporting on top of JMirror, on top of Selenium, on top of Taurus, on top of Java, uh, Java based executions. And then the beauty is it's on demand. Uh, and you can scale a ton of cloud providers out there, uh, whether it's GCP, like Google Cloud, Azure from Microsoft or Amazon Web Services. Or you can run your load executions or load generators behind the firewall by setting up your own private locations. So think of as if there is a tool out there, which is a continuous testing platform that is available on demand, SaaS-based, and it can sp- spun up tons and tons of load generators on the cloud that a specific customer is, is, has an NDA with or has agreed upon with. So if you need to do load testing or just straight up testing, forget about load, right? Because that'd be the other thing is just let my test run for one and let that be running all the time. It would cost money. We'll put we'll put it that way. It would cost money. Watch your credit card. Maybe that would be the thing to, to be saying here, just like you would with any cloud provider. But if you need that coverage, if you need to be able to see, okay, what happens with when it's just standard traffic all day long, Blaze Meter is one of the ways you can do that. Yes, and and another, I would say, best ROI out of this, you know, out of Blaze Meter is it's a SaaS based, cloud driven performance testing tool, right? There is no, you don't have to maintain infrastructure at, at a specific organization you can pretty much execute them directly on blazemeter and blazemeter handles the allocations the provisioning of of the servers and then maintaining of the suite well all of Barath's information is going to be down in the episode description and uh anything else you want to say Barath, before we head out yes absolutely this this has been a great opportunity darren and victor uh it very I would say a detailed conversation on how testing has been changing over time from, I would say, a linear waterfall mechanism to agile to AI based. And I, I would say try to, you know, embed continuous testing into your software lifecycle. I think the benefits I, I would definitely see 
with the approach not only us as a you know as a as a product company or but in general the industry that is seeing is if you implement continuous testing you can find defects earlier on with continuous testing you can go to market you can accelerate your software delivery and then have that faster feedback cycles at a quicker succession and it obviously help helps the organizations release their software to the customers pretty quickly and reduces risk you know i think i probably said this multiple times is reducing risk of a negative impact to business operations is probably the most reason why customers move away from a specific application whether they're trying to purchase something on on a mobile device or or a browser is try to reduce those 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 defects coming into production try to reduce that that scalability issues and obviously with ai i think the collaboration is is humongous now right it's pretty pivotal with continuous testing and ai that you need to bring all the parties like developers and testers and operations and then make sure that it's a cohesive and then a comprehensive approach towards software building software quality software and into production All right, Barath, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.